Hi there, welcome back to the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation channel and it's a privilege to be back again and I haven't done a video for quite a while now so a bit out of my comfort zone but I'm trusting Father just to take control over my mouth and my heart and just to have his way. So um, today we're going to talk about nevertheless. Um, this is something that Father has worked into my own heart and um, it's it's it's, you know, the call upon my life is to prepare the workers for the time to come, the tribulation, and what the church will have to endure. Um, and discussing the things of our heart, um, renewing our minds, having the right disposition with regards to what we will have to face, which is not uh, that far away. We already see the signs uh, slowly sl uh, simmering in um, from all different areas in our lives, um, uh, all different spheres of life, whether um, government or schooling or um, the medical um, arena, doesn't matter what it is, we're already seeing the persecution slowly um, but surely coming our way. And so we need to prepare our hearts, we need to understand that um, already where we are at is working in our hearts to have the right character um, that will be able to, and the right spirit that will be able to um, cause us to endure, in, endure right to the end. Okay, so, um, you know, a while back I had, uh, I was going through a very difficult time in my marriage and um, my husband and I were talking and, and, and we were just having a general conversation and he made a joke and I, I laughed I thought it was quite funny and in that moment that I laughed I, I sensed such a love for him and it was so strange because I wasn't at that place at all with him and I knew father was speaking to me and when I spoke to father about it he just simply said to me it doesn't matter how you see him what only matters is how I see him and when I thought about that, that really spoke to my heart. And he then started to elaborate on the fact that, um, especially when we pray for anybody, whether you're, whether you're in a good position with that person, you know, you don't have any problems with them, or whether you're in a not so good position, you know, they've harmed you or hurt you, or betrayed you, whatever the case may be. It is always important for us when we pray for them to ask him how he feels about them. You know, and to asking what we are to pray for. Even if logically we know what to pray for, we are to ask. And he will reveal his heart about them to you, if you're willing to hear. And from out of that context, we can pray. Because if we don't do that, we, we pray out of the filters of our own heart. Out of uh, negative disposition, unforgiveness, emotionalism or sentimentalism, um, opinions, uh, traditions, those kind of things. We start praying from out of that instead of being guided by the Spirit of God. So it does matter tremendously how He sees the person we are praying for or any circumstance for that matter. So Father was speaking to me about being able to see the way He sees. And He says in Isaiah 55 verse 8, He says that his thoughts are not our thoughts and our ways are not his ways. It's much higher and he thinks differently. And so it behooves us to understand that because he's given us the mind of Christ, the, the, the word says that the spirit knows what is the will of the Father and prays the will of the Father through us. So it's important that we understand that we need to see things the way he sees it. Um, not so long ago, I did a devotional um, post that I posted on my um, blog. It's called the Spirit of Wisdom and Revelation blog, if you're interested. And it's called Liberated by Love. And Father started speaking to me about um, how we are prone to see things in black and white. Um, this constitutes, for instance, uh, we have not just the law, or the scriptures, that we, you know, it's cast in stone and this is the way it is, you know, and there's no deviation from it, which sounds correct. Um, but even things like how we, revelations we've received, um, 
whether it's through dreams and visions, whether it's through understanding of the word or whatever it may be, through our own research, whether it's a calendar, the Sabbath, his name, how long the tribulation is or not is, um, th those type of things, um, they can easily become a law unto us. And it's black and white. And we start placing we people in, in a box of the haves and the have-nots, or the do's and the does not. Um, so we think in that way, and we start to discern that way in black and white. And we do the body of Christ a great harm when we do it. Um, we are then not subject to the Spirit, but subject to our own interpretations and understanding. And he says to us, do not lean on your own understanding, but in all your ways, acknowledge me. You know, he's not just saying, don't lean on your own wisdom as man. He's saying, don't even lean on what you think you know is correct. Always lean on me. Always acknowledge me in everything you do. Because he sees different than we do. So as Father was speaking to me about this black and white thinking, he was impressing it upon my heart that um, white in itself is, is a reference to light, right? Um, and light has all the color spectrums in it. And he is light. And not so long ago, he, he told me that I will no longer see in monochrome, which is black and white or gray, gray but I will see in color. And he was referring to being able to see through the eyes of love, which is light. Light has all the colors and God is light and he is love. Um, so the way we are to discern is and see is through the glasses of love. Discernment is not about what is right or wrong. Discernment is about how he sees something. And so he wants to shift us to an absolute dependence upon him, to trust him, when, to walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So if you're interested in that um, uh, uh, devotional post, I will put it in the description box for you to read as well, that link, and you can read it. So in Matthew 6, um, Yeshua speaks to his disciples, and um, he was also speaking with regards to um, money and uh, the divided eye. So let's go read that. That's in Matthew 6, verse from verse 22. Let's just go there and we read that. Okay, and he says here, the light of the body is the eye. Okay, light is synonymous with understanding or revelation. The eye is your discernment. Okay, so if you have understanding, if you have revelation, your body will be full of light. Okay, so the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, the, thy whole body shall be full of light. Okay, so a single eye is required in order for your whole body to be full of light. So what does a single eye constitute? A single eye is a reference to dove dove's eyes. Um, Song of, uh, in the Song of Solomon, Solomon speaks to the bride and he tells her that she has dove's eyes. He says just one look of her eyes overwhelms him. So she only has eyes for him. And a dove's eye, um, a dove cannot, doesn't have peripheral vision, so it can't see a landscape. It can only see one thing at a time. And that's the reason why doves cock their heads. They need to um, be able to see whatever is on the ground by cocking their head. Um, then Yeshua says here in verse 23, he says, But if thine eye be evil, so thy whole body shall be full of darkness. So the opposite of a single eye is a divided eye. The opposite of a good eye or an a, 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 a eye that's full of light is then a divided eye. Okay, so, but if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Then it says here, if therefore the light that is in thee be darkness. So, in this eye, you have light and dark. But that light is constituted also as darkness, because the eye is divided, right? And it says then, how great is that darkness? In other words, 
your eye, which is synonymous with discernment and the ability to see, is in darkness when you only see in black and white. Light, which is that of the single eye, is that of love, which sees in color. Now, not long ago, I was sitting here in my quiet time and just meditating on him and his love and I, I realized that there has been a veil lifted from my eyes to be able to see things in color and what I mean by that is that I no longer look on things that happen to me in my life as black and white. I see other, everything in the spectrum of color of his love. I look at what happens to me in my life as an act of love from him. Because nothing can happen to me unless it comes through the Father, the Spirit, and the Son. Nothing can happen to me. I am invincible in that sense because I am in Him. So therefore, if anything happens to me, it first comes through Him to me. Therefore, I do not need to fear. Whether I truly believe that will constitute whether I see in color or not. Whether It will constitute whether I truly see through the eyes of love so I was speaking to him about of his of his love that just transcends circumstances and our understanding and then helps us to discern correctly and we read about that in Philippians 1 <clears throat> let's go there Philippians 1 verse 9 to 10 here Paul tells them he says and this I pray that your love may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. So judgment is the word discernment here. And knowledge is, you know, the understanding that you get from scripture or whatever. But he's telling them, you need to understand that love needs to abound in these things. The word abound is overflow, abundance, over and above. So he's saying, you can have all the knowledge, you can have all the discernment, you can judge you know, have a great understanding between right and wrong. But you need love to abound in those things. Okay. And then he tells them in the next verse, in verse 10, he gives them the reason why. He says, that ye may approve things that are excellent. In other words, approve, discern, understand, point out. Be able to approve things that are excellent, which is perfect. You may be able to see perfectly, discern perfectly through the eyes of love. That ye may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So he's telling them here that during this time, remember Paul is here writing to the Philippians, this time of great persecution. Um, uh, the book of Philippians is actually about suffering joyfully. That's what the book of Philippians is about. So he's talking to them in a time of, of, of great suffering and tribulation, which is a type and shadow for us to read. We need to read the scriptures as if we are with them in that moment in tribulation. Okay, so he's telling them here, this love will help you to discern correctly with whatever happens to you, and then you will walk in sincerity. And you will not be offended. He says that you will be without offense. And we need to understand that during this time, Yeshua tells us, um, I think it's in Luke 22, uh, he tells us that we will be thrown into prisons. And some of us will die. And some of us won't die. He tells us that even of our own brethren will come and cast us into prison. And that we will be brought before magistrates. And that we do not need to even think of what to say. But in that moment, the Spirit, because we are guided by the Spirit, will give us the words to say. And will remind us of all things that He said to us. Okay. So, this is what Paul is talking to them about. He's saying that in that moment, when you need that discernment, your heart will be without offense. <clears throat> you will not be offended by the fact that whoever... Those closest to you have turned against you. Yes, you will be hurt, because we're not robots. Yes, you will be hurt. But you will be able, because that love abounds, you will be able to approve that which is excellent. And your love will be sincere towards them. 
and you will be without offense so that in that moment the gospel will be able to be preached to them they will have an open heart to receive the gospel because you do not take offense who is sufficient for these things and yet the, the scriptures are written for us as an example and for us to learn from it and to appropriate it so he's talking to us please understand that during this time you need an understanding and a revelation of my love. So, Paul talks about this in Ephesians 1. And this is also where the name of my channel has come from because I prayed this for many years. So he says there in Ephesians 1 verse 17, let's read 17 to 18, it says that the God, he's praying for them, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the Father of glory may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation. For what? In the knowledge of him. This is the reason for the spirit of wisdom and revelation. Not so that we necessarily can understand and the scriptures can open up to us. Because the scriptures testifies of Christ. That is what the spirit of wisdom and revelation is all about. It's about the knowledge of him. And who is he? He is light, he is the truth, and he is love. And so Paul is saying, you need a revelation of who Christ is. He's telling the Ephesians this. Now, we need to understand that that which was shall be again. The first church that is mentioned in Revelations is the church of Ephesus. The last church that is mentioned in Revela Revelations is uh, Laodicea. We are presently in the church age of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church that is black and white, neither here nor there. So because he cannot even handle her in his mouth, he spits her out because her love has become lukewarm. So because we are now at the last church, that which was shall be again, the next church age will be the church of Ephesus. This is the church age of the apostles. And it's the church age where the church is told that she has lost her first love. The Laodicea has become lukewarm. There's at least something there. But the church of Ephesus has lost her love. In fact, her love has grown cold. And so here, Paul is speaking to the Ephesians and he's saying to them, you need a revelation of who God is. And he says this in verse 18, he says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened. See, we're talking about discernment here and we're talking about light. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that ye may know what is the hope of his calling. So he's talking about a calling here, but he says that calling can only be understood in the light of who he is. And this, that needs to be said again. He's talking to them about a calling and that that calling can only be understood in the light of a revelation, spirit of revelation, wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of who he is. He says, and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints are. So he's talking to them about the fact that they need this understanding. Now, did they know Christ? course they knew him but he clearly understood their spiritual disposition at that stage that's why you will find in Ephesians 3 where Paul starts praying specifically that they will be rooted and grounded in his love that they may uh, uh, have be filled with the fullness of God and have an understanding and comprehension of his love he says that they may know the depth the width the length the height of his love that surpasses mere knowledge but experience, it says in the Amplified Bible, experience. And that he is able to do super abundantly above all we could ask or think. So Paul's whole emphasis in Ephesus is love. Right? This is a time of great persecution that will start to filter through. And people will then be introduced already to the mark of the beast. 
it's only when we get to the church of Smyrna, which is the next church in Revelation, where you will see it's now in the heat of the battle where beheadings will take place because of money. It's all about money. The world revolves around money. Money controls the world, right? So here already we find that their hearts will grow cold because of suffering. I've got a... a, a, a a devotional teaching on, on YouTube that's called Enduring Love and it speaks to the Church of Ephesus as well. So money and the desire to save themselves, their hearts will grow cold. You must remember the, the famine will start taking place, uh, war will start taking place. People will want to protect their families and they will want to protect themselves. And in order to do that, they will have to, they will choose them whom they will follow. They will choose, either I will hate my brother, my sister, my father, my family, my friends, in order to save my own family, or I will deny them, as Christ has said, this is the only ones who are worthy to be my disciples. And even if they had to die, because I am not willing to deny Christ, so be it. There will be those two parties, and those whose hearts have grown ice cold will find it very difficult to say no to um, those who will put pressure on them in order to save their own lives. For a morsel of bread, they will easily sell their inheritance like Esau. They will do it. And the words, as Yeshua said, they will cast us into prison. You know, the, our loved ones, those we never thought would ever do anything like this to us. And how will we be able to deal with this we do not have a revelation of who he is and his love. This is why Paul is emphasizing love over and over and over. So when I thought about Paul's love, you know, I, I father started speaking to me about Paul's disposition with regards to his spiritual children. And we read in scripture about Paul, he, he whenever he, he speaks in the, the letters or write in the letters, he's, he, he starts to saying that, I thank the Lord always for you. It's like he was so grateful for them and he had so much, so many problems with them, but he, he was always thanking the Lord for them. He, he was, he loved them so, so much, you know, and he would say things like, I have you in my heart. And he would say, uh, if it was possible, we, we want to share the gospel with you, but if it was even possible, we would even give our own souls. What kind of love did Paul have for the brethren? What kind of love did he have? That kind of love transcends circumstances and it transcends understanding. Think of the things that Paul had to endure and was willing to endure for the church. We're talking about fasting. He was beaten more than Christ. Twice or three times, I think, he was flogged. Imprisonment. Um, shipwrecked. Destitute. Running for his life. Fighting with beasts. I mean, the list is just, we who have no understanding. And here is Paul, and he is willing to endure these things for his children in order to move from place to place. And Paul had such a love. And we must understand that Paul is an extension. He is the resurrection man. He is a type and shadow of Christ after the cross. If you look at how Paul gave up everything for the church, you see the love of God displayed through this man. And he is an example unto us that we are to emulate him just as we would. That's why Paul said, follow me as you follow Christ. Who can say that? He could say that because of the type and shadow that he is in the word of God. He could say that with boldness. There was no discrepancy in the way he walked with regards to how Christ walked. That's why he could say that. Think of just how amazing that is. He could talk about his gospel of grace. So um, 
Paul had such a love for the church, such a great, great love for the church. And we, in this time to come, need a revelation of the Father's love for everybody, for our enemy and for our brothers and sisters. And not so long ago, Father started uh, speaking to me about owls. And uh, an owl has three uh, membranes or, or uh, 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 eyelids or it's like a membrane over there a third one it's a translucent one and it's like I, I still mentioned that it was like a veil over their eyes and this made me think of 1 Corinthians 13 and we know this is the chapter about love and Paul wrote that obviously he had a great revelation of love in order to write this and the one thing that he said Paul said there he says you know, you can have all the knowledge, you can have all the faith, you can prophesy, you can give your clothes off your body, you can be burned, you can do all these things. But if you do not have love, you have nothing. And he says that love um, believes all things, bears all things, hopes all things, and love endures all things. And then he says, when, when the perfect has come, all these things will fall away. But what is that perfect? The perfect is love. When the perfect is come, he says, now we see only in part, but then we shall see face to face. Meaning, like you would see in a mirror, now we see uh, dimly through a glass. That was their mirror, which is obviously not as clear as our mirrors are. Now you see dimly, but then you will see face to face. Now you know in part, but then you shall know even as you are known. He's talking about a clarity of vision. He's talking about perception and being able to get right to the point. He's talking about walking in love. And he says, everything will fall away, but that which will remain is faith, or hope, faith, and love. And the greatest of these is love. So, um, not long ago, uh, or two weeks ago, I burned myself with some boiling water and it fell on my tummy and it left uh, a scar and the other day as I uh, showered I was drying myself and I saw this scar again and I, I was thinking you know because I don't take anything for granted or as insignificant that happens to me so I, I was thinking mm -hmm. father why did you allow this to happen why I mean there's a scar now on my tummy and um you must want to tell me something. And as I turned around, just left it at that, as I turned around, I wanted to put some spray that I'm putting on my hair because I've been losing some hair. And um, this spray has placenta in it. And at the moment I touched it, I knew what the Spirit was saying to me. And he was talking to me about childbirth. He was talking to me about, because I had to scar my tummy. And I thought at that moment about... Um, you know, us women, when we give birth, we get stretch marks. And uh, more often than not, these stretch marks are there for life. Um, they're like our, our war marks or our, our pips, so to speak. And um, so it's, it's a, 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 the stretch marks is when the, the, our, our tummy is stretched to the ultimate. When you are stretched to the ultimate and it leaves a mark. And, and Paul had a saying, I think it's in Galatians 4, let's just go there. Um, Galatians is before Ephesians. Galatians 4 verse 19, he tells them here, My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. Paul is saying, he, he often spoke of himself as a nursing mother you know, or as a mother. And he's saying here, yeah, I am in travail. He's saying, I am experiencing pain, right? He's talking about the suffering that he went through, but that he went it through for them because, and it's also talking about intercession, but specifically the suffering. He's saying, I'm going through all of this travail for you. I, I, I'm willing to go through this for the body. Remember, we're talking about the time of tribulation here. We're not just talking about now where we still are safe in our homes. We're talking about the time when we will flee and where things will be required of us like never before that we wouldn't think ever would be. He's talking here he's saying, I am in travail for you, my children, until Christ is formed in you. And this 
uh, uh, um, I think it's in Galatians 6. Let's go to Galatians 6. Yes. Galatians 6 verse 17. Paul makes this interesting statement. He says, From henceforth, let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Now, immediately when we hear the marks of the Lord Jesus, we think of his piercing of his hands, his back, his head. And you can imagine what Paul must have looked like. <laughs> the marks Paul must have had all over his body. And he's saying to them, I'm, I'm going, stop troubling me. I'm going through all of this. I'm actually bearing on my body. I'm bearing the marks of Jesus Christ. And so when I looked into this, this mark, it actually means to be branded. Just like my tummy was branded, burnt. And the slaves, what happened at that time, the slaves would be burnt with a mark that constituted who their owner or their master was. So Christ, uh, uh, Paul is saying, I'm, I'm wearing the brands or the marks of Jesus Christ. And so we will, in this time to come, when we are persecuted, all over our bodies will be branded. <laughs> We're not going to be a pity sight. We will be branded. And, but it will be an honor. It will be a glory. And we will be branded and be in travail for the body of Christ, that Christ may be formed in those little ones, those that we bring in from the harvest until he comes and reaps them. Right? Um, this made me think of Father Nash. He was the intercessor, two intercessors, Father Nash and Praying Hyde. And Father Nash was the intercessor that two weeks in advance before Charles Finney um, had his revivals, he would go to whatever place it was and he would um, intercede in a room, him and somebody else as well. And um, so he would, him and somebody else would go into this room and they would be praying. And I re remember reading that this woman that was the owner of this uh, building would listen at the door and she would uh, go to other people and say, somebody need to go and see what's happening in that room because she thinks they're dying because they're lying on the ground and they were literally in travail. And Father Nash actually left next to his bed a permanent indent in the floor where his knees were. And they used to call him camel knees. I think James, the Apostle James, was also known as old camel knees because of their praying on their knees. It became callous. Another person is praying high to bore the marks of Christ on him. He had a absolute desire for souls so such a great desire for souls and he would be so passionately in prayer and so passionate it doesn't explain it enough um, but at one stage he had to go to the doctor because what they found out is that his heart moved slightly because of the crying and the uh, 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 just how his body and his whole being was in crying out to God for these souls. And that gives a whole new meaning to my heart was moved. <laughs> His heart was literally moved. And we find in Isaiah 53, which is an explanation of the marks and everything that Yeshua endured, um, we find there an explanation of what he went through. And right at the end, let's go there to Isaiah 53, Yeshua says, or the <clears throat> Isaiah says something there about... Yeshua and the travail that he went through. In verse 11, it says, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. So this travail of his soul is the cross, what he went through. Obviously, also his life, what he went through, was a travail. But the travail of his soul was on the cross. Now, if you travail, it means you're giving birth. What are you giving birth to? To sons and daughters. So even Yeshua is giving birth, giving birth to sons and daughters through suffering, a willingness to lay his life down. This seems to be the currency in saving souls. 
a willingness to suffer. Um, I remember not so long ago, I actually asked the Lord to give me a, an understanding of his love for the Jews. And I remember that day I was sitting here and it, it felt to me like I was like a little girl under a table at a banquet. And the uh, tablecloth was hanging over and I was just peeking out underneath the tablecloth just to peek a bit into that love that he has for the Jews. And I cannot tell you what happened to me in that moment. I was out for a count. I cried for days. Just when he filled me with his love for them. And that was just a peak. That kind of love has no boundaries. None. It will die for another. That's the love we need. That's the love we need. I know Richard Wurmbrandt, when he are busy reading his Tortured for Christ book again, and he would afterwards, after he was released, he would walk down the streets and he, the man was besides himself wanting to save people, wanting people, wondering, are you really saved? Are, are, you, are you right with God? He was beside himself wanting to get people to Christ. Are we? So, in the bride of Christ, we have the unfaithful bride and we have the faithful bride. We have the awake bride that is awake and alert. We have the sleeping bride, the lukewarm bride, okay, that compromises. An example of the faithful bride would be Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite, right? She's a representation of the Gentile bride, right? And she was with Naomi. And she told Naomi, your people will be my people and your God will be my God. And she then married Boaz, right? And Boaz gave her a good report. In fact, Boaz told her that she is virtuous, that she's left father and mother and country. So it's a, a reference to what I spoke about earlier, that being counted worthy to be his disciple. And we find Ruth in the harvest. She's harvesting with Boaz, right? But then we have the unfaithful bride. And this is where Father uh, taken me recently. It's in the book of Hosea again. And Hosea is a type and shadow of Yeshua. So Hosea is told that he must take unto himself a woman of whoredom and children of whoredom. And he must marry her. And he mustn't just marry her. He must love her. So the book of Hosea is about this prophet that marries an adulterous woman, loves her, and has to constantly bring her back from her adultery and love her again. Right? So remember, we're speaking about the disposition of the bride of Christ, the workers in the time that we are going in, with regards to the adulterous church or the lukewarm church, or even our and our enemies, not all, and our enemies. So Ruth is, a, is an example of this bride that is like Hosea. So what I want to bring across is that when we first give our lives to the Lord, He starts then to speak to us about His love for us. He comes and reveals His father heart to us. He reveals His mother heart to us, which is the spirit. It's like a mother unto us which is the comforter and the guiding and all that. And then he speaks of Yeshua, the bridal love. He is constantly affirming us, revealing his love to us, healing us, right? He speaks about alluring us into the desert and there he speaks softly to us. And then in Song of Solomon 8, you hear that she comes out of the desert, leaning with her head on the beloved. So no longer is she lured in, but she's become one. So once you have come out of the desert, you are no longer the one that needs to seek that love and affirmation from him. You are at rest in his love. You are secure in his love. You don't need affirmations of how he loves you. You don't need to hear 
um, how he will protect you. You don't need how he will provide for you. You don't need any of those things. You know that you know that you know that you know. You have gone through your wilderness where he has stripped you of everything because that's the purpose of the wilderness. Strip, stripped you of everything and has now become your source. There's no lack in him. No lack. And when you're in him, you have no lack. You have no want. Right? Psalm 34. So here she is, Ruth, and she's found her provision in her Boaz. Right? And Hosea, okay, that marries the adulterous woman and her children, is Yeshua. Now the bride is in Christ when she works here during the tribulation as a worker. Right? She now is as a prophetic entity, like Hosea, taking and marrying the left behind, her enemies. She is choosing to love them because she is now no longer the one that needs the affirmation of love. She's now the vessel of love. She is now the one that is willing to pour out her life like Paul, to willing to travail in birth, like Paul, willing to bear the marks of suffering of Jesus Christ for her. Just like Yeshua was told in the same way as Hosea, my son, go now and take unto you an adulterous wife. So we need to understand, let's look this also in the context of Jew and Gentile. Ruth was a Gentile marrying a Jew, Boaz. Moses was a Jew, married to Zipporah, a Moabite as well, a Gentile. You constantly, constantly see Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, right? So we have the bride consisting of, the wife of God consisting of both Jew and Gentile. And within them, we have the faithful and the unfaithful. And outside of them, we also have the enemies that he died for. So this is what he wants the bride to understand. Once you have an understanding and a revelation, the spirit of wisdom and revelation, knowledge of him, you will be able to perceive through his eyes the love that he has for the lost. And because you see the way he sees, you will be willing to lay your life down. I remember years ago, I knew that there was a love that I needed an understanding from him that transcends uh, understanding, actually. That transcends anything that I can comprehend. And I went to him and I prayed. And I, I remember, I still remember clearly where I was standing in my kitchen. And I said to him, Lord, I want you to fill me with your love. And I don't want any kind of love. I want that kind of love that transcends all understanding. And he said to me at that time, something that caught me of God. And he said to me, you do not know what you're asking of me. And I was like, okay. <laughs> and then the words came, nobody has greater love than he who lays his life down for his friends. You are my friends. What he was saying is, that kind of love is a suffering love. That kind of love will die for another. This is the love that he wants to pour into us because that is the love that endures all things. So think carefully before you ask him to fill you with his love. Count the cost. Also, we cannot go without this love. We cannot. We need it for the time to come. Desperately. And the interesting part about um, just there's a paradox with this whole Jew and Gentile thing. Um, in Ephesians 2, you, uh, Paul speaks to them and he says to them, um, 
he talks about the dividing wall that has come down talking about Jew and Gentile and that he make, wants to make all one the two shall become one the Jew and the Gentile shall become one in the end right and how it is the calling of the church first and foremost unto the Jew the Gentile is called the Gentile church is called unto the Jew first to proclaim the gospel then to Samaria and out to Judea and you go out okay so we need to understand this is first and foremost our call this is what Paul was talking about in Ephesians uh, 1 we said that you may know the hope of your calling that you may understand because he describes that all in the first part of Ephesians 1 talking about the dividing wall that has come down between Jew and Gentile and this is why Paul mentions in Ephesians 2 he speaks and he says for you are saved by grace through faith and that not through works that you will not boast right why is he mentioning this not so that we can go on about whether something's about grace or works He's telling them, don't forget you are the wild olive branch that have been grafted into the natural olive tree, which is the Jews, the Jude, as Judah. You've been grafted in. You as a Gentile have received grace through faith. Because he says in uh, Romans 11, is it 9? 9, 9 to 11, he starts talking about it. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. So we as Gentiles have been extended mercy. We've received grace through faith so that we cannot say, oh, but, you know, he chose us. Too bad if the Jews don't get it. You know, they'll get it one some other time, you know. They're going to have to go through what they need to go through to get right with God. You're missing the point. Our call is to them first and foremost. That's why Yeshua told the Samaritan woman, which is a Gentile, he told her, salvation is, or she said to him, salvation is of the Jews. And he told her, I am him. Right? And then by just that one woman, she went out into uh, her town and so many people were saved because she understood it. We must understand we are first and foremost called minister to the Jews but at the same time we might some of us might never see a Jew we might never in our lifetime um, see them however there's a mystery that lies within the paradoxes of life with regards to faith if we look at the Jew that you cannot find a greater difference between Jew and Gentile two different species <laughs> You cannot find a greater difference between a husband and a wife, between a parent and a child, between black and white, between certain denominations. Um, what else is there? Between uh, the faithful and the unfaithful bride, between friend and enemy. These are the paradoxes, the mystery of the paradoxes of the faith. And even Paul in Ephesians 4, he, he starts talking about the masters and the servants and the children, the fathers and the children that must not exasperate, exasperate them, exasperate, yeah, that's right, with, um, and the, the wife's hus, uh, 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 attitude towards the husband and the husband's attitude toward his wife, and he says, this is a great mystery, and I'm talking, he's talking about the unity between the husband and the wife, that's so different, but he says, I'm actually talking about Christ and the bride. So he's, he's saying here there's a mystery between these differences. And that mystery lies in the confrontation. It comes to the, it's about this face-to-face -face reality. When all the mosques have fallen off, when that which have been shaken has been shaken. We read about that in Hebrews 12. And only that which remain remains. When we look face-to-face -to, -face to our husband, to our wife, to our enemy, to our friends, to our to black or to white, whatever the case may be, we see them, the mask has been removed. And it's in that moment of confrontation that we meet him at them at the mercy seat, at the cross. That's where we meet each other and where the cross, whether we are willing to die for one another, um, will show whether we have an understanding and a revelation of his love. 
we will be sifted and shaken. And those who think they stand, those who think they've served the Lord for years and they will make it, these things are there for us to be humbled. That is why Paul speaks in Romans and saying, don't be high-minded because you've been saved by grace and they're still veiled. Understand that he can easily take you out if you're grafted in. It's so that we can be humbled. And so in this time, most assuredly, we will remain in a humble place. And this is the love that he wants to pour out into us. Love that is willing to suffer. Um, a while ago, I was watching a movie, and the movie was called um, Nevertheless. And um, it's actually about this girl, that a very innocent young girl that falls in love with this guy. And he, he has a tattoo in the back of his neck of a butterfly. And he, he is one of those uh, guys that just went from butterfly to butterfly. Um, very unfaithful and he had some serious trust issues but this girl was in love with him and she would constantly be confronted just like Hosea with his unfaithfulness and she would still um, remain faithful to him she would be very angry with him every now and then walk away from him but just end up turning back to him and that's why it was called nevertheless because nevertheless she was willing to um, just be with him um, in spite of his mistakes, in, in spite of his unfaithfulness. She loved him so much and he loved her, but he wasn't willing to commit and stay true to her because of his trust issues. And eventually, during towards the end of the, the movie, he had um, a lot of uh, 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 butterflies that he looked after, which re represented all the girls that he's, that he's been with. And at the end, when he started realizing that he can't go with this other girl whose name actually means butterfly, he opened the window and let all the other butterflies leave. And he committed himself to her wholeheartedly. And that movie was called Nevertheless. And so the father speaks to me um, by confirming something twice. Um, and that was through another movie. And that movie was called It's Okay Not To Be Okay. And in this movie, there was this girl whose mother was a horrible mother. Um, and she had a brooch that was a butterfly. And this girl um, was terrified of her mother. And this butterfly had such a great effect on her. And she had a complete negative connotation to this butterfly. And she would go outside and find butterflies and tear off their wings. And... Um, as his father just spoke to me about the fact that we're all just butterflies whose wings have been torn off at some stage. Um, but nevertheless, and this nevertheless spoke to me as well, because I, it reminded me of something that Paul said, um, that's in Philippians 1. Let's go there in Philippians 1 again. Um, verse 21 from verse 21 he says here for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain see he's seeing others everything in color he says in verse 22 but if I live in the flesh that is this is the fruit of my labor Yet what shall I choose, I what not. So he's saying he doesn't know what to choose, if he, whether he should stay here or not. For I am in straight, in difficulty, betwixt, betwixt is between, I am in straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to abide in the flesh is more needful for you. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all for your furtherance and joy of faith. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What are you saying here, Paul? Paul is saying here, I want to be 
with him so much. But my desire to be with you is equal and therefore I cannot make this decision. How many of us can say that? How many of us can say, you know what? If Yeshua had to stand here and say to me, what do you choose? Do you want to go now up with me and no longer suffer? Or would you rather prefer to stay down? What do you choose? <laughs> There's no contest. But Paul is saying, he, for their furtherance and their joy, he chooses nevertheless. Just like Hosea, seeing this unfatal bride, nevertheless, that girl in, in the movie that I watched, nevertheless, I will stay for you. That's how much I love you. That transcended love of Christ and of the Father in us. And we know that in uh, Luke, is it Luke 22, verse 42, let's read that. What did Yeshua say? in the garden of Gethsemane and he says considering what he was about to go through the suffering right the suffering because it's a suffering love verse 41 let's read from there and he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cost and he kneeled down and prayed saying father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will, but thine be done. Nevertheless. So, this nevertheless has to become a reality of the bride. That is the worker bride. She has to have such a strong nevertheless in her that can only come from a basis of having a true understanding and revelation of his love that love that is willing to lay its life down and we have to seek him for that love earnestly earnestly desire it for the time to come because we will not be able to go without it we will not be able to endure because love endures all things i want to read to you um Something that Paul said in um, 2 Corinthians 1. Let's go there, 2 Corinthians 1. I woke up the other day before I did this devotional, putting all the information together, and I wasn't um, yet aware in which direction Father was going. And I woke up at 10 past 6, and the Spirit impressed it upon my heart to look up that number um, in the Strong's Concordance 16. And I'll just quickly read what it says. It means judicial sentence, an answer, a judicial decision myself, whether I should come out safe from mortal peril. But nevertheless, I answered, I must die. So Paul is here saying, I have sentenced myself to death. I myself have sentenced myself to death. I've already proclaimed myself dead. Right? So I have a decision to make. We all have a decision to make. We all have to reach a place of nevertheless. We all have to seek his face and count that cost for the time that we are going to go in. And he has to work that nevertheless in us. So let's read what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 1 verse 8 to 9. He says here, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, in so much that we despaired even of life. Verse 9, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and doth deliver in whom we trust that we he will yet deliver us. Now this scripture is the scripture that is the only scripture linked to 610 in the Strongs. Which means that Paul was saying here, yeah, I sentence myself to death. I sentence myself to imprisonment. And in the time to come, 
we heard now that Yeshua said that they will cast us into prison. And there's a difference between, um, a great difference between you sentencing yourself to imprisonment or to death versus being forced into a prison and being sentenced to death. Unless we sentence ourselves to imprisonment, unless we sentence ourselves to death, how will we be able to endure? I expect nothing else from my life of what he has shown me, that I will be imprisoned. I've already sentenced myself to that imprisonment. I'm expecting it. I'm expecting it. But we have to sentence ourselves to death as well. We have to be willing to lay our lives down. And you cannot do that within yourself. There's no ways. There, it's only that love that will lay its life down. Not your will that will lay your life down. Because our will will always rebel against the spirit. Because the will is linked to the flesh. It's not that we can't submit but it will want, this, the flesh will cry out to be saved. But it's the spirit that overcomes. Only that which is the spirit is life. Only that which comes from out of his life, his strength, his wisdom, will endure. Not because we psych ourselves up with our will, but because something transcendent as his love has overtaken us and rules our life. And our ability to see the way he sees. It's through his eyes that we will see our enemy. I think of um, Judas. You know, Judas, um, when Yeshua washed the disciples' feet, I had my nevertheless moment the other day um, because I'm going through a particularly difficult time at the moment. And I had my nevertheless moment and I, I started thinking of Judas and how he betrayed Yeshua and I was thinking how Yeshua always knew about Judas and his love for money. And Yeshua was betrayed with 30 shekels which is the price of a slave at that time and this through Judas and Judas was his friend. It broke my heart when I thought of it that Judas was one of his friends it wasn't just one of his disciples they walked together they laughed together they joked together they slept together they saw miracles together how often didn't Yeshua spend alone time with Judas speaking to him knowing what's in his heart and he never he never stopped loving him he even washed his feet he bent down took a towel and washed his feet his friend that he knew would betray him. And on the night where he was um, giving them communion, you know, John asked, who will betray you? And he says, the one that I did my bread in the same bowl with. And I'm thinking when Judas, you know, ran away, how that must have broken Yeshua's heart. He knew what needed to happen. He already sentenced himself to death in the garden, right? He never passed, he already passed nevertheless. But to see his friend go and to come back and he betrays him with a kiss. And he says to him, have you come to betray me with a kiss? Our friends and family will betray us with a kiss. It's not going to be. Unless his love is in us, we will be offended. Our love will not be sincere. But Yeshua loved so ultimately. And I'm thinking of John 6 verse 66, which is the 666 chapter. It talks there about the followers of Yeshua, how they, at one stage after they heard that, he was speaking about sharing in his suffering by eating his flesh and drinking his blood. They knew that he was talking about that stage of suffering and they turned around and the word says they turned around and no longer followed him. And then he looked to his disciples and he said to them, are you also now going to leave me? And 
I can just hear the exasperation in him. And, and, and Peter said, Lord, where can we go? For only you have the words of life. And that 666 is the number of the beast and it points to the financial system as well. Once again, money, the 30 shekels, the church of Smyrna. And you look at John the Baptist, he's a type and shadow of the workers that points to the light. He isn't the light, but he points to the light, right? And he was found in the wilderness and he was li living from um, locusts and honey and there's a great prophetic significance happening at this moment where our meat is being substituted with crickets and locusts and who knows what that's the prophetic significance in the time that we are in think it not strange that it's happening now because we will be like John the Baptist we will be outcasts we will be Taken into the desert where we will cry, repent, repent. And John the Baptist was beheaded, which is what will happen to the church. Because they will confront the powers that be and they will bring many to repentance and baptize. Many years ago, can't remember how many, maybe eight years ago. Or so a friend of mine is no longer a friend of mine. It just left me. Um, she didn't agree with the the type of requirement the Lord showed me upon my life. The, the road was just too narrow, and she couldn't think that He would require the things of me that He did. And she told me that I have a martyr complex. And. She meant it as an insult at that moment. But I remember when she said it, I was rejoicing. It was the greatest compliment she could have given me to tell me that I've got a martyr complex. Because you see, at that time, when the Christians, um, just after, you know, in time of Acts, the outpouring, the Christians knew when they gave their heart to their lives to the Lord, they signed on the dotted line of their death certificate. Not so today. No, no. Now we hear, uh, when you get saved, you can have this and this and this and this. But then they knew, when you get saved, nothing you own is yours anymore. Because we have all things in common, because we need to survive. But by the way, you will die a cruel death. The probability of you dying is very high. But you can rejoice. And they considered it a privilege. That's why we read in Philippians, it says, let me just see, where does it write? In Philippians 1.29. Let's go to 1.29. Philippians 1.29. For unto you is given in the behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for his sake. For whose sake? Not for the brethren or your enemies, but for his sake. By extension, it means the brethren and your enemies. Because he says, um, when did you come visit me uh, in the jail? when you visited your brother and your sister in the jail and you gave a cup of water to this little one you gave it to me but it is for his sake because when you have an understanding of his love for you and for the lost and the left behind church when you have a revelation of that you will consider it a privilege to suffer for his sake in this Tortured for Christ, Richard Wurm Brandy quotes the following, and I just want to read this because it's, it's so beautiful. He's talking about this goal, and you can see it in the light of, of, of the church. He says here, one of the workers in the underground church was a young girl. The communist police discovered that she secretly spread the gospel and taught children of Christ. They decided to arrest her, but to make the arrest more agonizing, and painful as they could, they decided to delay her arrest a few weeks until the day that she was married. 
On her wedding day, the girl was dressed as a bride, the most wonderful and joyous day in the girl's life. Suddenly, the door burst open and the secret police rushed in. When the bride saw the secret police, she held out her arms towards them to be handcuffed. They roughly put the manacles on her wrist. She looked toward her beloved, then kissed the chains and said, I thank my heavenly bridegroom for this jewel he has presented to me on my marriage day. I thank him that I am worthy to suffer for him. She was dragged off with weeping Christians and a weeping bridegroom left behind. They knew what happens to young Christian girls in the hands of communist guards. A bridegroom faithfully waited for her. After five years, she was released. A destroyed, broken woman, looking 30 years older. She said it was the least she could do for her Christ. Such beautiful Christians are in the underground church. God will judge us not according to how much we endured, but how much we could love. The Christians who suffered for their faith in prisons could love. I am a witness that they could love God and men. One great lesson arose from all the beatings, tortures, butchery of the communists, that the spirit is master over the body. We know about the love of Christ towards the communists by our own love towards them. That needs to be read again. We know about the love of Christ towards the communists by our, our own love towards them. It was in prison that we found the hope of salvation for the communists. It was there that we developed a sense of responsibility towards them. It was in being tortured by them that we learned to love them. Richard says about those he suffered with for 14 years of imprisonment, I kiss their chains as the first Christians kissed the chains of their fellow believers when they were led to be thrown before the wild beasts. We need his love so much. And he has prepared a body, he says in his word, Father, a body thou hast prepared to do thy will. And he was talking about his crucifixion. But we are also his body. And he says, I delight to do thy will. He was willing to lay his life down. No man has greater love than he who is willing to lay his life down for his friends. Or his friend and then he says I call you my friend I want to end this with a word that father gave me a while back and I have mentioned and, and uh, read it before but I, when I spoke to him with regards to my own nevertheless um, he reminded me of this word and it brought so much comfort it's such a now word It's called a body thou hast prepared. And think of Judas as well when, when I read it, when Yeshua washed his feet. Okay. A body prepared. Let me love through you. When you surrender and offer your body as a living sacrifice, it will mean sacrifice. There will be a price to pay, which is to lay your will down so that my will can be done. In this your mind is renewed, to know my good, acceptable and perfect will. This is why I've given you my spirit, that you may live by every word that I speak. Therefore, to lay down your life as a living sacrifice requires you to constantly know my will in every situation. In other words, to see as he sees. Your will will always rebel against mine. It has to be laid on the altar every time in every situation. In that moment, 
you will hear. In that moment, you will understand. In that moment when you submit, I can love through you. It is my love that touches hearts. My hands, my feet, my mind, my mouth. All is mine. Therefore, as my body, you have to be subject to my will as the human body is to the mind. Instructions have always come from your mind, but now you have the mind of Christ. My mind. How will you know unless you quiet the distractions, the emotions, and the demands of your own will? Therefore, do not think this comes overnight. Practice makes perfect. Over and over, you teach your mind to go into the path I lead you. Have I not said that I will instruct and teach you in the way you should go? Surely all my eyes, so all my ways are peace. Therefore, walk circumspectly as a soldier at all times, ready to listen, to submit and obey. Trust me to guide you in every situation that I bring upon your path to make a way for you. Come each time to learn of me, for I am meek and humble. This is not about you. This is about a vessel given over to be used by me, so that I can love the lost, the broken, and the poor. Do you realize how much I want to touch them? To heal them like I did with the washing of feet. I said, Father, a body Thou hast prepared for me to do thy will. Your body is there to do my will, not yours. So let me have full play through you, through your hands, your feet and your mouth. Seek to do my will. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this word. I know, Father, that it's not an easy word. But Father, we need to hear this. We need to understand that a nevertheless has to come from our innermost being. And that that nevertheless has to come because you work it in us. It cannot come, it can come by a choice. We choose your will. But then you have to work it in us. Father, I pray for each person that knows in their heart that they have to make this choice that you will work it in them and that it will not be superficial that it will change their disposition completely and I pray Father for your body to receive the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of you in the depth the length the width the height of your love that you will fill us with your fullness those listening here Father that your anointing Will break the yoke upon their lives that you will fill them with your love give us a peak father bring us to that place father to that love that transcends circumstances that transcends understanding that will bring in a great harvest because they don't care how much we know they only care for how much we love we were sufficient for this father Surely we are not because we are just dust. But you, Lord, you have filled these earthen vessels with your love. Come and have your way in each person, Father, as they seek you with regards to this in earnestness, Father. And count the cost. I pray this in the name of Yeshua. Amen.